this morning is going to say, is going to remind us that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. We're going to look at the context of that and see a couple different stories and experiences where Jesus is going to emphasize the importance of the Sabbath and he's going to upset a few Pharisees. Um, I'm going to warn you right now. Be careful how critical you get of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees were sincere people who really wanted to do what was right. And it got so important to them that they made notes about the things that would help you do what was right. And the Sabbath was one of those things that they really wanted to make sure that they got right. And so they wrote a whole book. 39 different breakdowns in that book, four different main headers, but massive details of how they could keep the Sabbath holy. And I got a feeling there may be a little bit of Pharisee in some of us. So be careful how critical you get of the Pharisees. Well, here's a video, one out of seven. All right, so here we go. According to Genesis, the Lord created everything in six days, and then on the seventh day he rested. That is, he stopped. Doesn't mean he took a nap. It means he rested from the work he had done on the previous six days. So he blessed that day, and he set it apart way back when everything was still perfect, right? Right. One day out of seven. Later, I don't know, around 2,500 years or so, way after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and sin was everywhere, Moses pops up on the scene, hikes up Mount Sinai, and receives ten commandments from the Lord himself, written by his very finger. You saw the movie. For all you readers out there, take a peek at Exodus 20. Here begins the law, God's commandments. His design, not ours. For our benefit, not his. Now, out of all the Ten Commandments, we stop today on the fourth. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And in case we might not connect it on our own, God uses the same language in the first book of the Bible that he does here in the second to connect it for us. And I paraphrase. In six days, not five, not a million years, not an eon, in six days God did a bunch of work, making everything that we see and don't see, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, he blessed it and made it holy. He set it apart. One day out of seven. So we got ten commandments. We got eight don'ts and two do's. But inside, one of the do's is a don't, this fourth commandment. The do is to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. And the way to keep it holy is the don't. Don't work. Or more accurate to its intent, put aside the normal work you do on the previous six days. And make this day different. One day out of seven. Okay. So let's leap forward about 1,500 years or so to Mark chapter 2, and you'll see that Jesus says, quite frankly, man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for the man. Ah. Sabbath was made for the man. Huh. God blessed this day, and he set it apart. Why? For what? Well, perhaps it's a date. Maybe God is saying he just wants to spend time with us. Yeah, he created us to do all kinds of things and have friends and family and live our lives, but maybe he's saying he'd like to spend time with us too. Now he knows we're busy. That's why he gave us seven days. Six days to do all the things that we have to do. And one day to spend with him. One day out of seven. Mark 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never heard what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. 
Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely healed, excuse me, completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with Herodians how they might kill Jesus. From the Shabbat um, organiz, org, org website, they've printed up and there's um, several pages and pages of details of how you can keep the Sabbath. And they remind us at the beginning some good things. It says, Shabbat is a day of holiness set apart and elevated above the rest of the week. How many of you would agree with that? A day of holiness, a day set apart. That's, that's what holy means, it's set apart. And in this case, it's set apart for, for us to have some time. Did you like the video? For us to have some time with God. We're, we're coming here to have time with God. Frankly, you're not coming here to hear Bill. And, and frankly, you're really not coming here to hear the worship team. And, and you're not coming here, I hope, because there's a potluck afterwards. Or because there's coffee here and you don't have to pay for it here on Sunday morning so you can get it here instead of at the coffee shop. And usually there's sweets and goodies and you're not coming here for the sugar. Uh, you're probably not coming here for the parking places because there aren't enough of them. You know, so, but hopefully, the one reason why we're here is to get close to God. That's our desire. When we talk about worshiping God, we're talking about getting into his presence. It's kind of like, you know, frankly, I... Uh-oh, she's here. Uh-oh. <laughs> the lady seated in the back, my bride, is a lady I like to hug. I don't like to leave without giving her a kiss. But you think about that. This word for worship is about kissing God. It's about getting this closer connection to him. It's, it's about drawing close to him. It's, a, it's about hugging him. And notice, worship isn't just about what you do. Worship is also about what God's doing with you. As you come to worship, God's wanting to hug you. God's wanting to talk with you. God's wanting time with you. Okay, now, by the way, this is a Jewish website, but don't you agree with that statement I've made already? Shabbat is a day of holiness set apart and elevated above the rest of the week. Agreed? Okay, good. There's two aspects of Shabbat that are reflected in two expressions found in the two different presentations of the Ten Commandments found in the Torah. The first one, Exodus 28, says what? Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Remember Shabbat. Don't forget it. The second word is from Deuteronomy 5.12. Guard the Sabbath to keep it holy. These are the two words that Jewish tradition holds on to. They want to remember and guard it. Now, aren't those two good things? Don't you need to guard your time? Because how many of you have come up with all kinds of other things that might keep you away from worship at times? And it's very easy to get distracted and to lose focus and, and, and get so busy. And once you get out of that habit of remembering to take time with God, all of a sudden you realize that you've moved far away from him. And it's so easy to become distant from God. So again, I think we would agree with Jewish tradition, wouldn't we? Remember it and guard it. We, we kind of need to do that as we get ready to come here. It's, our sages explain that uh, melacha, that's the word for work, refers to the activities which were necessary for construction of the mishkan. That's the traveling sanctuary, the, 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 ta the tabernacle that the Jews set up while they were out in the wilderness. And the work that they did to set up that up, and they had about 39 different kinds of jobs and tasks that they had to do to get the tabernacle all set up. Well, on the day of worship, they were supposed to rest from that. They weren't supposed to work. They weren't supposed to do all those kinds of things. It goes on and says that, that, that they represent, that these um, melakot, 
or the principle behind them is that they represent constructive, creative effort demonstrating man's mastery over nature. Refraining from melacha or Shabbat signals our recognition that despite our human creative abilities, God is the ultimate creator and master. Do any of you disagree with that? I'm hoping not. <laughs> okay. God's the master, God's the creator, and Shabbat is about us acknowledging, look, yeah, I'm out there working and I'm creating, I'm doing all kinds of things, but when I come to Shabbat, when I come to this day, I'm acknowledging that even the creative thinking I do has come from God the creator. Then the abilities that I have are his and his things that he's blessed with me with. And so the work I do on this day, I'm gonna acknowledge the better part. The one who anoints and equips and gives me skills and abilities that I have. Anybody disagree yet? Okay, be careful how we talk about the Pharisees. But I gotta give you some more information. I'm just gonna give you a few of the things that were included. And, and this was a book, okay? <laughs> It used to be a scroll. I mean, it's huge what they, they wrote down. And now I'm going to give you some modern insights into how to keep Shabbat. Let's start with some basic activities which we refrain from on Shabbat. Writing, erasing, and tearing. If you're taking notes, you must stop. <laughs> Business transactions. That's probably a good one. You know, we don't come here to sell things to one another. It's always when I'm always a little nervous about, okay, I'm going to tell you that these benches you could buy. Uh-oh, don't want to be, you know, doing money changing in the temple. Driving or riding in cars or other vehicles. <laughs> How many of you did that one today? Uh-oh. Okay. Shopping. Mm -hmm. Using the telephone. Turning on or off anything which uses electricity, including lights, radios, television, computer, air conditioners, and alarm clocks. You have to figure out ways to have those things already on or go off automatically, but you have to do it ahead of time. There's a key word that we're going to talk about a couple times, and that is you've got to prepare for Shabbat. Cooking, baking, or kindling a fire. Gardening and grass mowing. Well, we don't do that here in the mountain. Do we? Doing laundry. Yes. Okay. Okay. In the next paragraph, it says, does all this mean that Shabbat is somewhat of a miserable affair where we sit hungry in the dark? <laughs> Not at all. It simply means that we have to prepare for Shabbat in advance so that on the contrary, we celebrate in luxury without doing any of the actual work on Shabbat. Okay, but what is some of the work? Muk, muktza. Muktza. We are forbid, forbidden from moving muktza. You need to watch out. Don't anybody be moving anything that's on this list. You may, it, muksa may not be moved directly with one's hand or even indirectly with an object. What's muksa? Muk, I'm not going to say that wrong. Muksa, excuse me. Objects which have no designated use. So when you go out there, you're not allowed to kick stones, plants, flowers in a vase, raw food, an object that has broken, or become no longer useful, such as a broken bowl or a button that falls off. If your button falls off here, you just got to leave it on the ground till tomorrow, okay? <laughs> You're not allowed to pick up mutza, which is valuable objects, and move them, those which could be used only for their designated task, for fear of damaging it. You cannot move expensive items like your camera, your crystal decoration, professional tools, a scalpel, an electric wiring, important documents, your passport, your birth certificate. Unless you can figure out a way to move them in an unusual manner with your elbows, your lips, and your mouth, or something like that. But otherwise, you're not allowed to move them. Objects that are forbidden from use because of Torah prohibition. You're not allowed to obviously be moving non-kosher food. Kamets on Passover are objects for a mitzvah, such as tefillin, shach, and the other items that are used in Passover. An object whose primary purpose is, has an activity which is forbidden on Shabbat, like, okay, no moving of hammers, staplers, pens. Somebody writing again? Okay, pens. Um, however, one is allowed to move these objects if they are needed for an activity permitted on Shabbat and nothing else can perform the task. A hammer to open a coconut, because you're allowed to open a coconut. Or a telephone book as a booster seat. 
Not, not to look in there to see the person's name, right? Okay. Okay. Or the place the object occupies is needed. For example, if a pen is laying on the chair and that chair is needed to be used on Shabbat, then you can figure out that creative way to move the pen off the chair so you can sit there. However, anything that a mutzah object rests upon is a basis, which means it's a base for the muksa, and it becomes muksa itself as well. The muksa item was left on the spot intentionally so that it remains here for at least part of the Shabbat. You can't move it. The object was placed there by the owner with the knowledge of the owner. They knew they were doing it. Can't do it. Move it. Anyway, so here, here's some more. You cannot carry anything on Shabbat. Now, there's a lot of details about that, but let me just give you these few. One Shabbat, one may not carry or transfer objects between your private place of residence and the public street. Okay, how many of you carried anything outside this morning? Oh, oh, broke Shabbat. Unless, well, before I get to the unless, (laughs) examples of this prohibition include carrying one's Carrying something in your pocket. Now, how many more carried something today that didn't raise their hand earlier? Carrying something in your pocket or wheeling a baby carriage or a shopping cart or going outside. Did anybody chew gum on the way outside the door today? You were carrying something. Oh, my. You're really in trouble. Unless, unless you created an A-roof. Now, what is an A-roof? An A roof, if you went together with the rest of the community and you designate a carrying area, and, and you have to, it has to be visibly, it has to be known, so you've probably put some banners out there and stuff like that. So if we make some kind of sig- banners and markings and all between here and Cedar Pines Park, for example, where we live, and we designated that as an A-roof, inside that A-roof, now be careful, if you get outside the A-roof and you carried something, you're in bad trouble. But if you carry something inside the A-roof, it's been designated, remember, before the Shabbat, you're welcome to carry stuff. Are you with me now? Well, it just goes on. Incidentally, food preparation. Is anybody going to cook any food today? Well, here's the thing. As long as we designated this kind of a heating stove, and and it's called a barat or something like that, and as long as you've had the the heating stove over there, dear, are you cooking for the potluck today? Did you have the oven turned on yesterday? (laughs) Man, we're in trouble. Because you gotta prepare ahead of time. And, And in fact, Now, if you want something that's cold, you you can't heat up something that's cold. However, if you have the brach that's there and it's a warming plate, you could put something next to it and it could just kind of get some of the heat of it. It's just not allowed to cook it. Okay? So, are you getting the idea that there's a few details here? (laughs) And these go on and on and on and on. And and the challenge is, is that Where did we start out? A day of holiness set apart and elevated above the rest. A time with God. And so Jesus comes into the synagogue. Actually, before he gets to the synagogue, they're walking through a field. Now, there's some more descriptions about that, how far you can walk. It was 1,999 steps. Please don't go 2,000. Okay, so it's, there's the number of steps that you can take. You could walk through a field, and here's the interesting thing. You actually could, and the, and the t- scripture actually said this, you could pull food from the, va- from the um, branches there, if there was food there, just as long as you weren't cutting it down, you weren't actually harvesting it, but you could just take some off of the, of the crop, and there was nothing wrong with that. Now, you do have a problem if you start to husk it, squish it, squeeze it, crumple it, uh, use a nutcracker or anything else like that, now you've broken the law. But there were steps that you could take. And so here's Jesus, he's with the disciples, they're going through a field, and what are they doing? They're grabbing grain off of of the wheat, they're opening it, and they're eating it. 
I think it says that they've broken about four of the biggest rules you can when it comes to their, because they're preparing, they're cooking, they're eating, they're walking, they're doing all this stuff. These guys are really bad and the Pharisees are watching this. Now what's interesting is that I wonder how many steps the Pharisees took to walk with them. So they're watching them and say, what, what are your disciples doing, Jesus? You gotta stop them, they're breaking the Sabbath. And what does Jesus do? He brings up the story of David. And, and the story of David is that and David, remember, is king of Israel, only he's running for his life because Israel and his son's been chasing after him. And so he, he is the rightful king. And he comes to the temple and his men are literally, they're starving. And he asks for food, and the priest says, the only food we have is the show bread. It's the 12 loaves that are placed on that little table right there in the midst of the holy place, They're, or the, the outside the holy of holies, the holy place. They're placed there, and they stay there for a week as an offering to God. At the end of the week, that bread is then given to the priests, and only the priests are allowed to eat the show bread. And the priest says, I don't have anything but the show bread. So here, since you are hungry, eat the show bread. Now this is really bad, because this is God's bread. And only clean, pure priests are allowed to eat this bread. And what? The priest gives it to them. Because this is the rightful king, and he is clean, and they're hungry and in need. And he says, look, they, do you remember that story? And they're like, I don't want to talk about this. You know, you, we still think they broke the Sabbath too. <laughs> and so Jesus goes, goes away and he comes back into the synagogue the, um, the, probably the following week. He's probably there at the city of Capernaum, the uh, <laughs> synagogue where he's already had an experience, where he's already healed a man. He's already gotten a bit. They were not so noisy that day until later in the day when he claimed to be the Messiah and they claimed to be God. That kind of bothered them. And that's what's been continuing to upset them. And they go into the, to the synagogue and now the Pharisees are there and now they're going to get him. Did they bring this man? We don't know. It's very possible, isn't it? Man with a withered hand, you know, crippled and up. And, and so let's, let's, let's like put him where Jesus can see him. <laughs> and, and let's see what Jesus does with this man. And what does Jesus do? Well, he probably has the idea, okay, this is about trying to get me. So let's give it to them. Withered hand man, stand up. Right here where everyone can see you. And then there's these two questions that, that he's going to ask. Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And as you probably notice, the the Pharisees are rather silent at the questioning because they can't really answer it. Well, you're supposed to do good. You're, no, of course you're not supposed to do evil on the Sabbath, but you're also not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so they, they, they're, they're un unwilling to answer the question. Let me back up to what Jesus said in the first context. After telling the story of Abiathar and David, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. How many of you have religious rituals that you do? Patterns you follow? Spiritual patterns? How many of you are doing them for the Lord? And, for how, and how often do those things fall into a ritual that loses its meaning? When you come to worship, have you really thought about why you're here? Are you here to serve the Lord or in some way to be served? 
Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus, in saying this, does not remove the importance of the Sabbath. He does not remove the religious legalism, even does he, related to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of physical restoration and spiritual renewal. It's a time to get re-energized, if you will. A time to get in the presence of God. But what Jesus does that really upsets the Pharisees is he says the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. What's he mean? That God has authority to change the Sabbath rules. That's what he did with the, high, with the priest who gave the showbread. And that's what he's doing on this particular day. God has a right to use the Sabbath for God's purposes. So to the man who's standing there with the withered hand, he's standing now in front of the group. He will say what to the man? Stretch out your hand. I believe it's William Barclay who said, man is not to be enslaved by the Sabbath. The Sabbath exists to make his life better. Christianity is more about doing things than in refraining from doing things. And the best way to use sacred things is to use them to help men. That, in fact, is the only way to give them to God. And then finally, the sacredness of the Sabbath is built upon the moral principle of grace rather than the religious regulation of the law. John MacArthur says they're callous, they're compassionless, they are brutal, they are merciless toward people suffering, they are fanatical about their self-righteous rules. He's speaking about the Pharisees, the religious people. This is what Jesus had in mind, by the way, when he said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and following, he said this, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wasn't talking about people who were doing physical labor. He was talking about people who were under the burden of an oppressive, restrictive, Sabbatarian legalism from which you could get no relief, from which you never were delivered from a guilty conscience. You think about it? If you miss any one of these, you're, you're done. You're bad. And there's law upon law upon law upon law. <laughs> Although there were only 10. And Jesus says, come. Come unto me, you who are lab- labor and heavy laden. I will give you what? Yes. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. Learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So what is it that causes you to lose focus here when you're in worship here? What gets you distracted? I don't know about you, but this morning, boy, the empty chairs sure got me. (laughs) Why this week? There's not that many ladies up there, a thousand pines. <laughs> Where'd everyone else go? <laughs> and, and all of a sudden you can get distracted by that, right? And now I just helped some of you to get distracted, didn't I? <laughs> what is it that gets you distracted? This morning I realized that some of my notes I had left on the printer at home. Oh no, I've got to run home and get them. <laughs> There's not time to do that. I realized also, get this one, this is a goofy one. I realized that my pants are brown and not gray. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're all looking, yeah. I'm trying to hide. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I had the brown pants, the gray pants out this morning. And, and so when I put them on, I get here to the church. It wasn't until I'm walking up outside. And I, oh, my goodness, this is not the gray pants. <laughs> so now I'm distracted. Too. Okay, Debbie, I got to go home and change pants. No, you're not. <laughs> There's no time for that. Yes, I need to, dear. I can't be up there with black shoes and gray brown pants. So, you know, okay. Got to change something. (laughs) What gets you distracted? It's easy to get distracted by songs that you don't know, isn't it? Or by a song that you say, I don't like. (laughs) Or by a rhythm that you are uncomfortable with or a noise or whatever. It's easy to get distracted by the very people that are trying to help us to put our attention on God. It's easy for them to get distracted by all the work they're trying to do to get the rhythms together. The keys and the chords and the notes and everything. And to get so busy with taking care of the children in the nursery or preparing the food for the potluck. And getting everything done right and making sure that that bread you're supposed to be smelling what you're not smelling yet I don't think are you you are smelling it okay if you're on that side of the room you might be smelling the bread that's baking that might make it for the communion time or not who knows are you getting distracted yet there's all kinds of things and the busyness and all the work of the work of life 
can hinder us from getting into the presence of God. I actually enjoyed it a week, what was it, a week, about three weeks ago when the PowerPoint and the whole media and the whole communications on the computer wouldn't work. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, because we can get so focused on all the work of all that and doing all the things of all that that we don't just worship God. What's distracting you? What causes you to lose your focus? Do the people around you distract you? Do you get distracted by the stuff instead of the worship? Are you so busy with the activity of worship that you don't worship God himself? When you come to worship, what takes your attention away from the Lord? Why are you here? I want us to be friendly. I want us to welcome one another. But if you're here for each other, you're going to miss God. If you're waiting for people to come serve you, you're going to miss God. Why are you here? So Jesus says, oh, I, I should have quoted this too, Deuteronomy 23, 25. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. Jesus said, it's okay to do some of this. Deuteronomy gave you the permission, but is it lawful to save life or to kill it on the Sabbath? Now Jesus is about to drive some things home. He's taking the steps to save this wretched man's life. He says, they're thinking about methods of what killing. He's trying to save the man, and what are the Pharisees getting ready to do? They're going to go talk with the Herodians, the politicians of all people. I'm not saying politicians are bad, but these politicians were supporting a Roman king. So they were kind of in trouble in Jerusalem. And Jesus, and they're going to go out from here, these Pharisees are, and they're going to unite with the Herodians in order to what? To seek to kill Jesus. He knows what's on their mind. What is better, to help this man or to kill on the Sabbath? And what are you guys thinking of doing? You think they've broken the Sabbath? Huh. Pretty seriously, but they don't see it. There's nothing in the Old Testament about not helping people on the Sabbath. Did you know that? Nothing. All it says is don't work. Don't do your normal work. So does that mean you don't do anything? No. You prepare food for the family. You go visit relatives. Well, you didn't prepare food if you were a good Jew. But you and I probably do. It's just different than the normal work that we do. Barclay said it was a Sabbath day. All work was forbidden. The heel was to work. The Jewish law was, to, was definite and detailed about this. Medical attention could be given only if a life was in danger. To take some examples, a woman in childbirth might be helped on the Sabbath. An infection of the throat might be treated. If a wall fell on anyone, <laughs> enough might be cleared away to see whether he was dead or alive. <laughs> If he was alive, he might be helped. If he was dead, the body must be left until the next day. A fracture could not be attended to. Sorry, you got broken arms. Going to have to stay that way. Cold water might not be poured on a sprained ankle. Well, you'll have to wait till the next day. A cut finger might be bandaged with a plain bandage, but not with ointment. Okay, the infection's going to start anyways. That is to say, at the most, an injury could be kept from getting worse. It must not be made better. That's not what the Bible, that's not what the Torah, that's not what the Old Testament said. It's all the rules and things we added to that to try to get it straight. Well, yeah. I got so much more. I'm just going to skip it though. But let me just say this. That I, found, um, I found a website. It's a Christian website, a good website. And, and it was talking and used really good scriptures but it was talking about the things that even today we should be doing to make the Sabbath special. And it started falling into, well, how do you know? When I was growing up, we did not go out for meals at restaurants on Sunday. We didn't go other places. We didn't have card games and things like that. You didn't do all kinds of things like that on the Sabbath. And, and you, know, you can understand why people who are wanting to honor God may come up with some things that they would say, you shouldn't do this. 
So we didn't have Little League even. Even when my sons were growing up, we didn't have Little League on Sunday, did we? Because that was the one day you didn't do it. You didn't do other activities like that on Sunday. So you didn't go to games and things like that on Sunday. Today, (laughs) anything goes, doesn't it? But can you understand why sincere people with a sincere desire to get closer to God would say, here's some things maybe that wouldn't be helpful for us to do on the Sabbath. Don't get distracted, folks. There's two verses I want you to think of. Two two passages. The first one is from Hebrews 13, verse 15. It says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. On the Sabbath and any day, we ought to be doing what helps others. We ought to be offering sacrifices of praise to God. And then it's a passage I mentioned earlier. I come back to it again from Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Jesus would say to us on the Sabbath, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And Jesus is inviting us to come to him on the Shabbat, the weekly day to come to him and to get rest from him, to bring our burdens to him, to come and work alongside of him. Interesting comment. To literally work alongside of him. He says, look, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You tie on with me and we'll do this together. And that's what the Sabbath is to remind us to do, folks. And I encourage you and challenge you and invite you to do this. We remember what he sacrificed today. As we remember the body broken and the blood shed for us. That Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you to come to me and rest. Come and be refreshed. Come to Jesus. Um, Kathy Joe, did it finish? <laughs> if, if it's finished, please don't burn your hand because we're not allowed to help you. If we said, <laughs> okay, let's just, let's just make it simple. Let's just forbid sin on the Sabbath, okay? Wouldn't that be the easy rule to say? Just, just don't sin on the Sabbath, okay? Wouldn't that make it a lot easier than writing up all these books and lists and stuff of what they had? Just don't sin. <laughs> that might be harder, huh? <laughs> Which is why we came up with all the various details and all the stuff of don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this, and all all these other kinds of things. The list I was reading to you earlier. And if you want to know more, I've got more. (laughs) But God is inviting us to come to him. To come to him. So he comes to the Israelites and they're out there on the Sinai and he gives them these instructions and those instructions could be summarized as they were by Jesus. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the work of the Sabbath. Come love God and love your neighbor. Folks, so if that means that you're going to change somebody's tire, a neighbor's tire, I think that's good for the Sabbath. If you're going to help somebody out, I think that's good for the Sabbath. But don't miss the first part, that the Sabbath 
is about coming to the rest and refreshment that God wants to give you. It's what he's going to give Israel. Notice, these are people that have been in 400 years of bondage, slavery, and in the last few years, it got nasty. Now he says, come and rest.